Greetings, everyone, and thank you for joining us for another Four Score Speaker Series program. On behalf of the Lincoln Presidential Foundation, I'm delighted to welcome Caroline Jeannie for an in-depth discussion on her most recent book, Ends of War, The Unfinished Fight of Lee's Army After Appomattox, published by the University of North Carolina Press in September of 2021. From the publisher, Janie's book reveals that Lee's surrender was less an ending than the start of an interregnum marked by military and political uncertainty, legal and logistical confusion, and continued outbursts of violence. Janie takes readers from the deliberations of government and military authorities to the ground level experiences of common soldiers. Dr. Janie is the John L. Now III Professor of the American Civil War and director of the John L. Now Center for Civil War History at the University of Virginia. As an aside, we share Mr. Now in common as he is a treasured member of our board of directors. He's a true champion of preservation and history. As a graduate of the University of Virginia, Janie worked as a historian for the National Park Service and taught at Purdue University before returning to Virginia in 2018. An active public lecturer, she has given presentations at locations across the globe. She is a speaker with the Organization of American Historians Distinguished Lectureship Program and a recipient of the Kenneth T. Kaufmill Outstanding Undergraduate Teaching Award from Purdue's College of Liberal Arts. She serves as a co-editor of the University of North Carolina Press's Civil War America series and is the past president of the Society of Civil War Historians. She's published seven books, including the one we're speaking about tonight, and Remembering the Civil War, Reunion and the Limits of Reconciliation from 2013. Welcome, Carrie. Thank you so much for having me. To kick things off, please tell us how you came to the field of history and what led you to write this book in particular. So mine was a wandering path to the field of history. I always knew that I enjoyed history and probably the earliest moment that I can point to was my fourth grade teacher, Miss Colors. She taught, it was the first time in an elementary school that we had history, so it was Virginia history. But it wasn't just the way that she taught history. She also read the Little House on the Prairie series to us, and we would read along with her, but she would stop every once in a while, put down the book, take off her glasses, and tell some story that had something re related to something from, from the book that we were reading. And that sparked a, a passion for storytelling. So history throughout high school was always something I was very interested in. When I went off to college, I first thought that I would be a biology major. And so I have as many bio hours undergrad as I do history. I ended up being a government major thinking that I was going to law school. And then my fourth year at UVA, I took a class pass fail in the history department because it wasn't my major with Edward Ayers. Mm -hmm. And that changed my world. If you've ever heard him speak, you get just a little glimmer of what he's like in the classroom. And he was magical and blissfully unaware of the academic job market. I was already working for the National Park Service as an archivist and historian. So I, I had that in my background, but I was going to law school and then taking Ed's class, I decided to apply to grad school, again, blissfully unaware of the academic job market. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, we're glad that you did that and that you have stayed with it. Um, and we all get to be the beneficiaries of your research and your scholarship. Um, so let's dive into the content of the book itself. As you know well, Appomattox was, and to a large extent still is, shorthand for the end of the American Civil War. Lee surrenders the Army of the Northern Virginia to Grant. Boom, done, that's it. That's sort of the narrative that we're used to. Right. But you provide a really stunning body of evidence and research that proves that the reality was very different from that. There was the military and the legal end of the war that were drawn out, messy, chaotic, not unlike the start of war and war itself. So could you please set the stage for our audience about the context of the lead up to Lee surrender at Appomattox? So are, are, you're, you're thinking about the actual military lead yes. up? Yeah. 
So, and if, you can you can narrow that to the weeks before, if because I know that 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 could be a really big question. But narrowing it to the years. weeks in the lead up, right, 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 right. So, the founding of the union, right? <laughs> right, right. Where, where do we we begin with with that? So, let's just start the first week of April and think about when it finally becomes apparent that Lee is going to have to abandon Petersburg, and by abandoning Petersburg, that likewise means abandoning. Richmond. And so as those troops are pulling up from the fortifications, I think we, we often forget that, that there are still fortifications around Richmond at this point. And as Lee and his uh, army pulls out of those two cities, he's heading west, not looking for a place to surrender. I think there's, there's this misnomer about the, the, the flight to Appomattox as if that was the destination and that somehow this is the, the path to surrender. Lee is very much looking for a railroad line that can take him south so that he can meet up with Joseph Johnston and continue to fight the war. So that push westward that's happening first to Amelia Courthouse, and then it's clear that, that, that Grant is hot on the pursuit and is cutting off every available line as that week goes on and the men are falling out of Lee's ranks. There are countless descriptions by Union soldiers, both officers and the rank and file, about the men that are, are simply kind of just um, melding, if you will, or melting into the Virginia woods, that they are, are exhausted, they are tired, they are hungry, they are, are not able to keep up with the relentless pace of Lee's army as it heads west. These are, are night after night, there's night marches and mm -hmm. the men are, are getting maybe two hours rest each evening. There's a good bit of rain that's going on. And so the demoralization in the ranks is, is pretty low and Lee's army is absolutely shedding people. That will be compounded by these various battles that are happening as the armies push west, especially at Sailor's Creek. There's a famous anecdote about uh, Lee looking down at, at Sailor's Creek and saying, in effect, what has happened to my army? Where, where is it anymore? And so this exchange of letters that begins, Grant will first propose to Lee that in fact he should surrender. Lee hedges a bit. These letters go back and forth. Finally, by the morning of April 9th, as Lee looks out in front of him and realizes that it's no longer just cavalry in front of him, but in fact, Union infantry he knows he has no choice but to capitulate. Mm -hmm. And so at that point that we have the famed meeting in the McLean parlor, but I think it's really important to keep in mind that there was a campaign that leads up to this. It isn't Richmond and Petersburg and all of a sudden we're at Appomattox. There is a struggle, there is a fight that is going on throughout that week. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was even stunning in your book that you mentioned that the desertion, the problem of desertions from the Confederate ranks was so bad that if I remember correctly, General Lee even issues an order that even joking about desertion is going to bring about a punishment. And that that's happened earlier. That that happens mm. back in February because mm. things were, were getting pretty bad then. But it's, you know, At by the time, of yeah, it, it's, it's really bad. And there's a, a notable, pe people are noticing that it's men from Virginia. And there's a reason why these are men who are relatively close to home, as opposed to those say from South Carolina or Alabama or Texas. And those numbers are, are really difficult to, to find. But if you look at some of the prisoners of war that are captured along the way, significant number of Virginians have decided at that point that this war is not worth fighting for any number of reasons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, we're in the Appomattox, we're in Appomattox courthouse now. What was Grant's goal in creating the terms of surrender? What was his driving force? So he has instructions, very specific instructions from Lincoln about what he can and can't do. And the short version of that is he can deal in military matters and military matters alone. So he is to, to either destroy Lee's army or to compel its surrender. He can't discuss anything that, that even veers toward discussions of what peace might look like. So he's, it's, it's strictly about getting the surrender of an army. Grant's done this twice before. 
Mm -hmm. He compelled the surrender of, of two armies. And this is a pretty significant feat. He knows this is no easy feat to accomplish, but that, that's what he is allowed to deal with. He cannot talk about political issues whatsoever. He cannot talk about state governments. None of that is on the table. He is simply to get Lee's army to lay down their guns. That being said, he knows that Lee's army is the centerpiece of Confederate nationalism, not Jefferson Davis, not the government that's sitting in Richmond or no longer in Richmond, but many of them on train cars heading toward Danville. But, but Lee and his army are the, 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 the central piece that everyone is looking to. And if, if Grant, who has been waging this war against Lee now for a year, if he can convince Lee to lay down his arms, then maybe that will convince the other armies in the field, whether that be Joseph E. Johnston's or Kirby Smith's to do the same, to follow the lead of this most important element of what it means to be a Confederate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So symbolically, it meant perhaps more than the Army of Northern Virginia, but in practical terms, to whom did the surrender apply? Well, that was the great question. And this isn't something that Grant and Lee hash out. This is a question that would be left to the six commissioners. Before leaving the McLean House on the 9th, both Lee and Grant would appoint three generals who would, would hammer out those specifics, things including what that surrender, that formal surrender parade would look like. Um, that hadn't been the case at Fort Donelson. It hadn't been the case at Vicksburg. There's something smaller that happens at Vicksburg. But, but Grant had, had said to his subordinates that he needed some sort of formal surrender ceremony. And so they have to deal with those issues. They also need to decide to whom does this apply? And they decide that there's a radius that, that men from Lee's army who, who are within this radius, they will be considered part of Lee's army and part of the surrender. But Grant probably had, had come to a similar sort of understanding because on April 10th, as he's making his way to Burkeville Junction, it's gonna head back toward Washington he gets a, a, a telegram from Secretary of War Stanton asking him to whom do these surrender terms apply? And Stanton is specifically asking about troops, detached troops that are operating in Northern Virginia. And more specifically, he's very much concerned about John S. Mosby, the, the oh. guerrilla, the partisan fighter. And Grant's response is, well, technically it only applies to those who are with Lee at that moment, but I think we should make it as broad as possible so that we can, I mean, I'm putting words in Grant's mouth here a bit, but, but the gist of what he's saying is so that we can make sure that every single one of them has laid down their arms. And part of this is that if you are a paroled prisoner of war under the laws of war, if you break that parole, the punishment is execution. And Grant, as a soldier, was, was betting on the fact that a paroled soldier was more honorable than a, a disloyal civilian. And so if, if, if he can get all of these soldiers to take on their honor that they are a paroled prisoner of war, not to raise arms again against the United States, then that to him is the best step toward peace. That's the best step toward ending the military rebellion. So rather than having these men disperse into the mountains and valleys and take up guerrilla warfare, he really believes that being as generous as possible with these paroles, and again, these paroles aren't sending men to, to prison camps. It means that they're, they're taking an oath that they will go home and not disobey any laws. Grant believes this is the, the, the quickest and most practical way to end the war. Mm. So, I mean, the, the goal was restoration of the Union and peace, not so much like a very clear-cut victory. Is it safe to say that? Well, I mean, that, that's what Grant wants, but Grant can't deal in, in those right. issues, right? Right, right, right? So what he needs to do is just make sure all of the men in arms are laying down their arms, that they're surrendering their arms, that they're no longer combatants. That's that's his primary goal. That's his objective. That's what he's been instructed to do in the most magnanimous of ways by Lincoln. I mean, we can look to Lincoln's um, 
his words is the second inaugural is, I mean, we, there's a lot of different places that we can look, but the second inaugural with malice toward none, we, we see that notion of these are our countrymen and we can't punish them if we want them to want to willingly be our countrymen again. So, so even though that's Grant's long-term objective, his only real objective, the only real authority he has is to compel the surrender of men in arms. Mm -hmm. um, so you're appreciating that General Grant's view would be that paroling, and it sounds like that might be one of the most consequential terms of this surrender, is how he treated paroled prisoners of war, or we're going to, that um, he's, he's sort of counting on the honor of soldiers. Absolutely. But to, to be clear, paroles aren't new at Appomattox. This Fair. had been used throughout the war. I mean, Confederates are also issuing paroles when, when they capture the arsenal at Harper's Ferry, for example, those men are, are paroled and sent home. So it, that, that's what had happened after Vicksburg. 30,000 Confederates are, are sent home and it, rather than to prisoner of war camps. And they have to be exchanged in order, technically they have to be exchanged in order to fight again. So the fact that Grant is including paroles as part of the surrender is not unique. Mm -hmm. What is unique is the language that he uses that says that these men won't be disturbed by U.S. authorities unless they break the laws that are in place in their homes. And that's the language that is going to cause such a kerfuffle among many parts of the North. And many Confederates are going to run with that and see that as a blanket amnesty. And that's what Stanton and others are really going to start questioning immediately after the surrender, but certainly following Lincoln's assassination even more so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how much based on your research of that was based in this idea that's expressed in the Lincoln second inaugural, also in the proclamation of amnesty that, um, you know, uh, we're essentially gonna treat, the, treat Confederates as enemy combatants not as traitors, not as people who have committed treason against the United States. Can you, can you talk a little bit more about that? Because you also in your book note, I, I love the quote from Grant uh, where he, he thinks, and I'm not gonna get the quote right, something to the effect of uh, his belief that the Confederates were fighting for a cause that he thought was one of the worst cause they could fight for they've done something that's disloyal to the United States, yet they're relying in some part on um, this appeal to honor for them to re-enter the union and move past the civil war. Can you talk a little bit more about it? It, it feels like a disconnect. Yeah, so I'm, I have that quote stuck in my head now that comes from, from Grant's memoirs. But so there's a couple of different things going on here. On one hand, you have what Lincoln has already been talking about in terms of reconstruction with the December 1863 amnesty, um, the, the so-called 10% plan, where he mm -hmm. is looking for such a small percentage of loyal people, of people within every state to pledge that they are loyal to the United States and that from there they can go about setting up new governments. And this is a way of, of, of ending the rebellion and bringing these states back into the union. So we see a bit of that, that very generous, uh, very capacious understanding of amnesty that, that we find from Lincoln. We also see that, as you mentioned in the, the second inaugural, but, but probably more important where Grant is concerned, when Lincoln has come um, down uh, just outside of Petersburg and met with, with Grant, and Sherman and Porter aboard the River Queen in mm. late March. And this is precisely the tenor of that conversation that we need to, to be judicious. We need to be to, to welcome. We can't punish them for, for what they've done in, in so many words that, that slavery is absolutely off the table. But otherwise we, we need to be magnanimous if we want people to want to be part of this country again. So, so that's the, the, the tone, if you will. Mm -hmm. But then there's the legal question and the way in which Confederates have been treated. And 
legal scholars, uh, people such as Cynthia Nicoletti will talk about this dual status that Confederates have. And we can look at the Supreme Court case, the 1863 prize cases, which are about privateers. And the, the, um, the essence of that has to do with whether or not Confederates, individual Confederates, so we're not talking Confederate states, but individual mm -hmm. Confederates, whether they are enemy belligerents or whether they are insurrectionist. And if they are enemy belligerents, then you treat them as you would if you were fighting France or Mexico. And as such, they are protected by the laws of war. So if you're imposing um, a blockade, you can't impose a blockade against your own countrymen. So you're, you're already treating them as a foreign entity, as, as an independent nation, if you will. If you are taking prisoners of war, you don't take prisoners of war against your own citizens. So the, the prize cases give us this very murky understanding that Confederates can on one hand be treated as enemy belligerents that are entitled to these protections. On the other hand, maybe in some cases they can be treated as individuals who've committed treason. Grant is not a lawyer, but he also is very well aware that under the laws of war, Confederates have for the most part been treated as enemy combatants. And if you have an enemy who surrenders to you, you cannot punish them, you cannot try them for breaking some law if they are um, you know, a, a foreign entity. So this is where the, the military side is kind of converging with the legal questions. And, and this is where the end of the war brings into stark relief all of those messy questions that have been there since the very beginning about what is the Confederacy? What is a Confederate? What does it mean to, to end an insurrection or a war or a rebellion? Are those the same thing? Are they different things? And it doesn't get any easier at Appomattox. If anything, mm -hmm. the messiness becomes even more apparent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and that was a, a line that Lincoln was dancing on, who was Lincoln, who was a lawyer throughout, how when when to treat them. It's it's almost like when was he wearing his commander in chief hat and when was he wearing his president in the United States hat? Right. Um, because it does feel like it was being treated both ways. Absolutely. Um, throughout the whole thing. How I mean, you're referencing um, prior examples. There's what what is outside of the Civil War? What are the precedents that they're looking at? How much are how much is Grant? How much is Lincoln concerned with the sort of cycles of retaliation and renewed war that were examples they would have learned about from Europe, for example? Right. How much of that is weighing on their mind? So, you know, in the moment at Appomattox, that's a possible to tell with Grant, mm -hmm. but surely they are aware of other moments in world history in which there is seemingly peace and then there are retaliations that ensue. I think for, for Grant, if we're thinking about his own experiences, you know, there's Mexico mm -hmm. and the Mexican-American War is probably more relevant for Grant than, than the wars in Europe in that particular moment as he's sitting in McLean's parlor, he has this, this great line that he uses in his memoirs where he says something to the effect of, as I sat down at the table, I, I, I only knew what was in my mind. And it's as if his pen just did the writing for him and he, he had no predetermined idea what he was going to say about what this surrender would look like. But he absolutely had all of those things somewhere tucked in the back of his mind, that experience at um, in, in Mexico, the, those experiences at Donaldson and at Vicksburg. And so in, in thinking about these cycles of retaliation and revenge, th that is, is maybe part of the, the, the background. I don't think that's part of the foreground at this mm -hmm. moment. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that the reaction to grant the terms was immediate and mixed. Certainly there was a lot of celebration mm -hmm. um, and then maybe a fair bit of criticism too. Um, how did that compare to the reaction throughout the Confederacy? Um, as you point out in your book, 
even the Army of Northern Virginia didn't fully surrender. You know, there's a detachment of nearly 20,000 soldiers um, who are trying to either, you know, take a break or immediately regroup, join other forces in the Confederacy to fight again. So how does how does the surrender affect the Confederacy? So there's so many different perspectives that we could take on that. I was largely familiar before working on this book with um, middle and upper class Confederate women and their reaction to the surrender and their refusal to acknowledge the surrender. There are countless diary entries in not just April, but into May of 1865 with hopes that somehow France is still going to sail into the Chesapeake Bay and and the Confederacy, all hope is not yet lost. And so there's this fervent belief that Lee's surrender, yeah, that wasn't good, but we can still we can still kick this thing. What I was more surprised to find were the number of men, and granted, in, in the large scale, if there were approximately 28,000 men who formally surrendered at Appomattox, there are another 20,000 who should have surrendered, as you referenced, and didn't for a variety of reasons. Of that, a portion of those men who were determined to continue the fight. A lot of them were uh, cavalry troopers or artillerists who had access to horses. And a lot of them are young men. I mean, all soldiers were young, but but early 20s men who came from slaveholding backgrounds, many of them educated at the South's elite universities at what's now South Carolina, at UNC, at, at Virginia, that are bound and determined that all hopes for Southern independence are not yet lost. And their desires to, to meet up again, that they're going to disperse into the mountains, into the Blue Ridge Mountains, and then when there's a rallying call from people like Thomas Rosser or Thomas Munford, they will come together and fight this war once more. Or a, a more significant number head south, determined again to meet up with Joseph E. Johnston and to fight the war with him. Or if that's not going to work, they're going to head west and join Kirby Smith. Mm -hmm. So you know, I, I, I guess I had heard of some of those stories, but I was really surprised at the, the number of men who were absolutely determined, even, even with the clear knowledge that Lee had surrendered, that they were going to continue the fight. As they dispersed through the Virginia countryside and into North Carolina, and, and even as they head west, and, and in some cases north, which is a different story, they're encountering a variety of civilians, both black and white, many white civilians that are absolutely devoted to the Confederacy and are still devoted to these Confederate soldiers. Shouldn't be any surprise that the lost cause becomes what it does when we see these communities that are, are giving every last chicken and every last morsel that they have to these men who are passing through and excusing their behavior in places like Danville or Charlotte where the, or Greensboro, where the men are raiding government uh, quartermaster uh, supplies. And, and it's seen as, well, that's theirs. They were soldiers fighting on our behalf. They shouldn't be looting private stores, but if it was a government warehouse, then that's all fair game. And so there's this, this continued support for Confederate soldiers, again, even in the wake of defeat, and yet they're also encountering unionists who are refusing to feed them or who are pulling out guns and threatening them. And certainly African-Americans, many of whom have not learned about emancipation. The notion that emancipation somehow happens on January 1st, 1863 or April 9th, 1865, simply does not hold water. And there are, are plenty of African-Americans that the Confederate soldiers, as they're making their way home or wherever they're going, are talking about forcing them to help them uh, ferry across rivers or to provide food for them. And they're still referring to them as, as slaves. There are some, some of these Confederate soldiers who are making every effort to go find their enslaved property and hide them from Union mm -hmm. troops. So 
April 9th is not this definitive day in the lived experience of people. We can look back now and absolutely mark it as an important watershed. But, but I think watershed is, is in some ways more definitive than, than what actually happened. Mm -hmm. Well, and less than a week later, Abraham Lincoln is assassinated. What is the immediate impact of that news and that event on this process of the war maybe winding down? What is the reaction? What's the immediate impact? Well, the, the, the most uh, pressing and the, the, the biggest announcement is, <laughs> in fact, maybe this isn't over. And on a very basic level, the killing is still continuing. And that then is read and interpreted different ways. The reaction to that plays out in different ways. For example, Lou Wallace, who is a general who is Republican, absolutely a diehard Republican who is in command in Baltimore. Baltimore, although it is in Maryland, which has stayed loyal to the Union, has a significant a number of Confederate sympathizers in the city and a significant number of men who had left to go fight for the Confederate armies. And as those men are sailing back into the Boston, Boston, into the Baltimore Harbor, uh, Wallace is enraged. He'd already been enraged, but he is absolutely livid in the wake of Lincoln's assassination. Number one, Booth had been from Baltimore. So that just gives him even more evidence of these vast conspiracies. But he is bound and determined to prevent Confederates from coming. And those who come, he is going to make shed their Confederate uniforms immediately. That had not been part of the surrender terms. He's going to make them register at Provost Marshal's offices. And if they aren't from within a certain portion of Baltimore, they're going to be expelled or held as prisoners of war. And so he is, is very much cracking down. There's also an effort to round up any of those men who have not yet been paroled. And so there are a handful of men, especially if we think of what today we might consider the outskirts of, of Washington, DC. So Fairfax County, Virginia, kind of Northern Virginia area that's within proximity to Union lines. Union soldiers are going out and searching for any Confederates who might've come home and who have not yet been paroled and they are arresting them and they're taking them to um, prisoner of war. Um, facilities. On the other hand, Grant believes it's even more important to parole as many soldiers as possible. So he encourages many of the men in his command to, to, to seek out and parole these men, not lock them up, that he wants to end this once and for all. And so we see these very different reactions. And one of the things- I'm that not sure I understand. Siri loves to to, to, to chime in all the time. I need someone to show me how to turn her off. Um, that we, it very much depends on the local level, the commander at a local place. The reaction in Norfolk, for example, is very different than the reaction in the Shenandoah Valley, in part because of who the local commanders are. And so Lincoln's assassination is a catalyst for for a, for a variety of different types of reactions and responses, all mm -hmm. of which are intended, again, to quell this rebellion as quickly and efficiently as possible. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Maryland, um, which is one of the border states. And as your book points out, 75,000 Confederates were from loyal states from the Union. Um, how did they deal with those individuals in the midst of all of this? What, how do you deal with Confederate soldiers going back to Union, their homes in Union states, could they? So this is one of the most surprising things that I found in doing the research. I suppose maybe I should have anticipated it and, and asked this question, but I didn't know to ask the question, what does it mean for Confederates to return to a loyal state? You know, and it's one thing to deal with Confederates in states where the vast majority of the population has supported secession or supported the Confederate cause. There, you know, you have some different legal questions about the validity of secession. All, all of that is, is kind of in the mix. And how do you readmit a state 
those are all questions for reconstruction, but it's very much about the individuals when you're talking about states that remained loyal to the union, namely Missouri, Kentucky, and Maryland, if we're talking about any significant portion. West Virginia is going to be its own special case. <laughs> but that, that becomes the question that, that Grant is dealing with. The attorney general will offer an opinion about whether these men are allowed to return home. Stanton will ask the question, are these men allowed to return to Washington, D.C. or to Maryland? And the answer in mid-April is no. Mm. They're, they're not allowed to return home. They have given up their homes when they chose to fight for the Confederacy. But the, the military isn't doing enough in the eyes of these local communities. And so these vigilance committees form and they form in counties throughout Western Maryland. And their job is to go out and hunt down any Confederates who have returned home. In some cases, they just intimidate the men. Um, but there are some cases in which the men are, are physically um, abused. Some of them are, are um, you know, pistol whipped and otherwise driven from, from town. And then West Virginia becomes a whole nother um, hot mess, to use a very yeah. technical term. Because Grant and, and Attorney General Speed both say that these provisions are, the, these restrictions prohibiting Confederates from returning to loyal states apply to states that had not passed ordinances of secession. So here we can see those political and legal questions um, getting mixed around again. West Virginia, though, have been part of Virginia. And Virginia had a secession convention and had voted to secede. So what do you do with them? Well, they people from West Virginia that are loyal to the Union believe they should have the same protections against former Confederates coming back. And they believe they should have them even more so than places like Maryland because they are afraid of the legal and political ramifications of Confederates returning to a state that they didn't even believe should exist. And that is questioning whether or not the state of West Virginia would continue as a state. Was it possible for it to revert via court cases or otherwise to Virginia? And this is not out of the question. There are, are, are several counties, there is a Supreme Court case where Virginia is actually trying to get several counties back fails, but the notion that Confederates could come back and vote in a state that they had been trying to destroy is absolutely absurd to those in West Virginia. So what do we see? The same thing. We see these committees of vigilance and safety. You can hear that Revolutionary War rhetoric uh, ramping up there that again, trying to protect their local communities. Um, in some of these communities, men are in fact, Confederates are in fact killed for coming back to their homes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you also mentioned the Emancipation Proclamation just a bit ago, and it, it feels to me like there's a bit of a parallel between the symbolism of Appomattox and then the reality of it and the symbolism of the Emancipation mm. Proclamation and the reality of it. But from a timeline perspective, if enforcement of the Emancipation Proclamation is in states in rebellion and is being enforced by the Union Army, and so the, the line of emancipation is essentially where the lines of the Union Army are, how does this Lee's surrender at Appomattox affect the um, advance of the Emancipation Proclamation, if you will, in words? You know, even I, I think a lot more Americans are aware of Juneteenth now that it's been declared mm -hmm. a national holiday. Um, and so more people are aware that that anniversary is June 1865, months after Appomattox. Right. Which also brings up the wild card that is Texas. So can you talk a little bit about how Appomattox affected um, the Emancipation Proclamation and its implementation and how this factors into Texas as an issue of the end, end of the war in particular? Well, I, do, I don't really write about this in the book, but keep in mind that the proclamation is um, a war measure. Mm -hmm. And the very reason that Lincoln is pushing for the 13th Amendment, which had been passed finally, I mean, he pushes for it in 64, goes through the Senate, but not the House after 
the the elections. Finally, it goes through the House, as we all know from from Steven Spielberg now in January of 65. But it's not ratified yet. And the, the reason that, that Lincoln had pushed for it is he knew that once the war was over, there was no longer the war powers clause couldn't be used to enforce that. And these are volunteer soldiers. That's the other big part that we need to keep in mind. Union soldiers, it's a it's a citizen soldiers army. They are volunteers. They do not want to stay in the ranks any longer than they have to. April 9th in the, the campfires around Appomattox, Union soldiers are talking about, yes, I get to go home. They have no vision about enforcing emancipation. Their goal is to destroy Lee's army, not to ensure emancipation and certainly not to ensure civil rights, let alone political rights for African-Americans. And so the proclamation, you know, it is very much contingent on the presence of Union troops. Greg Downs has a wonderful line in his book very evocative about emancipation by bayonet. And mm -hmm. that that I, I think is a, a really important thing to keep in mind that once Union troops leave an area, it's very difficult to ensure that in fact, freedom is going to be freedom. Mm -hmm. That being said, you know, you've got all of these months and if we look well beyond the village at Appomattox Courthouse, Kentucky, you know, slavery doesn't end in Kentucky until December of 1865, when the 13th Amendment is finally ratified. Mm -hmm. In the fall of 1865, there are still uh, sales of enslaved people in Mississippi and elsewhere. And so just as the Emancipation Proclamation is contingent upon Union soldiers being present, th that Appomattox in some ways and I have to think about this a bit more, but in, in, in some ways it, it, it hurts the process be, because it is ending that military conflict. And then the, the demobilization of Union soldiers will happen so rapidly mm -hmm. after, not just Appomattox, but after the surrender at Durham Station as well. So early May, Grant will start authorizing the demobilization of the Union Army. It goes from about a, hundred, about a million men in May of 65 to by November of 65, there's about 200,000 Union soldiers left, which is hardly an occupying force yeah. to, to enforce emancipation. So if we're thinking about these days that we can celebrate, these are our celebrate emancipation. They are our days that bring the promise of emancipation. For some, they are emancipation. April 9th, I should point out, there are the local... African American community in and around the counties that surround Appomattox County talked very much about Appomattox as Freedom Day. Mm. And for them, especially the fact that there were seven USCT regiments with the Army of the James at Appomattox blocking the Confederates from going west, African Americans had not only earned freedom on that day in, in, in their estimation, but had helped secure it as part of that military force. So for some, it, it really symbolically, absolutely is and was Freedom Day. But that experience was so very different. You could go 50 miles to the West and there were still people that were finding themselves enslaved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, let's go ahead and turn to visitor que or audience questions because we have quite a few. Um, first one is uh, very straightforward. How does Lincoln get news of um, Grant and Lee in at the once once they're coming to surrender terms? There's at, the, the at courthouse. Are you talking about? At, at, I assume this is the the surrender. So Grant telegrams yeah. <laughs> Grant telegram uh, telegraphs Lincoln to announce that the surrender has happened. Um, we have a question from Dan, and he asks if Meade had the capacity to have caught Lee's army well before Appomattox? Um, I'm trying to think exactly where Meade is because you have the, the Union Army is split at this point, kind of converging on the, 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 the Confederate Army, which is also split into two columns as it gets farther and farther from Richmond. 
And I don't know exactly where Meade was, but the, the big point is that even though Meade is still the commander of the Army of the Potomac, as of May 5th, you know, even before that, once Grant of, of 64, once Grant joins Meade in the field, it is effectively his army. And, he, and he's given Meade orders um, throughout from the Overland campaign on. He is the one, Grant is the one that is, is dictating orders. So I, I can't, I, I'm, I'm sure maybe there are some people that would, would disagree with this, but I, I can't imagine that Meade would have actually been the one to to oversee the surrender, even if he had um, physically been able to block Lee's escape. Yeah. Alan asks, what was the relationship between Grant and Lee? And I think Appomattox Courthouse was the first time they ever met. It's the first time they, they, they met at, during the war uh, as they're having this awkward uh, kind of chat before they sit down for the for the terms to be written out. Grant will, will say something about Mexico and remembering meeting Lee and, and Lee doesn't quite respond because he doesn't, at least he doesn't acknowledge remembering Grant from, or at least meeting Grant in Mexico. But, but certainly at Appomattox Courthouse is the first time that they have met during the course of the war. Mm -hmm. They've exchanged letters before, but it's the first time they've met in person. Um, you had mentioned that there were U.S. color troops and that there were enslaved African Americans in the vicinity of Appomattox Courthouse um, in the surrounding areas. Melvin asked if there were any African Americans with Lee's army. Um, Absolutely. As in, like, yeah. Yes. And this is something I write about extensively in the book. There were hundreds hundreds of African Americans, both enslaved and free, some conscripted by the Confederate Army, some were the, the property or had been leased by the, the soldiers in the ranks. And there are a host of quandaries that they face at Appomattox as well. Will they be able to make it to their own homes? Do they travel home with their former uh, slaveholders, or do they try to strike out on their own? Is it too dangerous to strike out on their own? Um, uh, how, how do they do that? They don't have any money, likely, either. They don't have any form of transportation, most likely. So the logistics of getting home for them are, are in many ways, even more complicated than it was for, for the Confederate soldiers who are, are trying to, to make their way home. But absolutely, those mm -hmm. men and probably a handful of women still in the, uh, um, with Lee's army. Mm -hmm. Alan asks what role the US colored troops played in the surrender. In the surrender, in this actual surrender, they are, I mean, they're part of that last military effort and they are blocking um, the way west, as I mentioned but they certainly don't play a role in the surrender. In fact, Ord is very well aware of the fact that, that the USCT could be seen as an insult to the Confederate soldiers. So they are kept at a, a great distance from the Confederate soldiers and they, they leave pretty quickly. But, but that being said, they are serving as provost marshals and they are all along the route home that Confederate soldiers are going to have to make. And there are countless diary and letters that, that talk about being insulted by having to turn themselves into USCT soldiers or having their, their passes checked by African-American soldiers. So at Appomattox, there is an effort not to allow them to, to mingle or to, to interact with Confederate soldiers, but it's, it's an experience that Confederate soldiers have as they're leaving Appomattox for weeks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, James asks a question uh, that actually reminds me of sort of a, a hilarious story or a series of stories that you reference in your book. And it's for the Confederate soldiers who surrendered and were paroled, were they given any, he asks if they were giving traveling money to get home, but in fact, it was a different situation, but not all of them went straight home. Some of them went up to New York. And tried. So can you talk a little bit about how their passage was provided for and how that had to change over time because they weren't necessarily taking the most direct route home? Right. So on the morning after the surrender terms are agreed upon, so on April 10th, 
Lee and Grant will meet once more that morning. And the, the reason it's the meeting is at the behest of, of Lee. Lee is worried about just how his soldiers are going to get home, the logistics of it, and whether or not they're gonna have any proof that they are in fact surrendered and paroled soldiers. And this is how we get the passes, the passes that many people are familiar with. This is something that comes on the morning of the 10th. Grant will call one of his Corps commanders. He'll call John Gibbon over. Gibbon says, yes, I have a press with the Corps. We can, can strike off these passes. The passes then can be handed out to all of the soldiers. And these passes then, Grant will issue special orders number 173 which says that the men can pass through union lines in order to reach their homes. And when they need to do so, they can use their pass for passage on government steamers and government railroads. The passes can also be used to, to get provisions, to get um, rations. So if you have one of these, or you've seen one of these passes, you might see a mark about X number of rations or you might see something about a steamer that's going to Augusta or perhaps all the way to New Orleans. The government is doing this at first until it becomes apparent that, that men are taking advantage of this and until Lincoln's assassination. Lincoln's assassination also curtails this a great bit because Aaron, as you mentioned, some of these soldiers are sailing not just to Baltimore, but also to New York. Uh, some of them are going to places like Baltimore because they believe that that railroad line will help them make a more direct route home. There's some soldiers from Tennessee, for example, who say that it's, it's much faster to go to Baltimore via a steamer and then take the b &O Railroad over, go down through Cincinnati, then to Nashville, and that's the most direct route home. But uh, Grant will not completely put an end to it, but it certainly will be curtailed once he realizes that soldiers are sailing into New York in order to go to South Carolina or North Carolina. But no, there's there's no money that is provided. And those rations, those rations are actually really difficult to come by. If you've got both Union and Confederate soldiers that are hungry and trying to make their way home, there's lots of accounts from soldiers who make their way to a place like Burkeville Station and they get there and there are no rations left. Mm -hmm. Um, Jim asks how many Confederate soldiers left the surrendered Appomattox and made their way to Johnston's army. Was that a reality or just a rumor? It is a reality and exact numbers are very, very difficult to come by. Problem was if they were within the vicinity of Lee's army, Johnston wouldn't accept them. So I tell the story of some of these young officers who make their way to Johnston present themselves and he asks exactly where they've been and when they essentially say yes I was with Lee at Appomattox he says well you're included within that within those terms of surrender and I can't accept you there are others who do make their way and they are paroled I have some some wonderful maps in the book that show the number of soldiers that were paroled in places like Greensboro and even Charlotte who escaped getting paroled, escaped being surrendered for one reason or another at Appomattox. But by the time they got to Johnston's army, Johnston was already in negotiations with Sherman by April 18th. So it's very much all for naught anyway. There is one great story that I tell of a, a soldier from, from Lee's army who, who makes his way to, to Johnston. Johnston says, I, you know, I, I can't have you in my army because you have already effectively been surrendered. But then he ends up printing the parole passes for Johnston's army. He's a, a printer in the Greensboro era, area. So even though he's been effectively surrendered at Appomattox, now he is printing the parole passes for Johnston's army. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Charles um, references the fact that Grant allowed Confederates um, to keep horses in order to ostensibly travel home or to help plow fields, you know, once they got back home. What about keeping arms? No, absolutely not. Except, except officers. Officers were allowed, but no rank and file man could do so. So it's only your officers who have their sidearms going home, mm -hmm. which proves a problem if you need to hunt 
on the way home. And, and many soldiers comment on this, you know, they can't kill any squirrels or whatever wildlife might yet be out there because they don't have any, any weapons. But that is the, the marker of flags and, and guns are the markers of an army. And so when you surrender, those are the things you have to give up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Miranda asks a question. She says, how many of the Confederates do you feel ended up as, and she puts unreconstructed in quotes, she says, or is that just a myth? <laughs> unreconstructed? No, lots of them. And, you know, again, there's, there's no number that we can put on that, but I can say that there are, anecdotally, there are a fair number who are very proud that they never were paroled. Mm -hmm. And in the the pages of the Confederate veteran in the 1890s into the early 1900s, lots of stories surfaced of men that I could confirm had in fact served, but had not been paroled. And they would write little stories proudly, never surrendered. And so if, if that's the basis of considering someone unreconstructed, that certainly I, I think fits the bill in my book. So, so very proud never to have done so, but others equally proud to have that parole pass in hand to show that they had fought to the very end and had not skedaddled, that they had not deserted when the going got tough. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Patricia notes that in our current world situation, she can see parallels and she specifically mentions the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Can you give your perspective? I know that in doing research for this book, you were thinking about the ends of wars broadly speaking. Um, I believe your book came out shortly um, after the U.S. was pulling out of Afghanistan. Um, so can you give your perspective, you could be as specific or general um, as you feel comfortable with how your research on this may be, um, how you've reflected on that and considering other wars and current ones that are occurring. Right. Well, obviously, I had no way of, of knowing that any of this would be happening. And I, I taught a course a few years ago at Purdue called Ends of War, and then decided that I liked that title. But it looked at how Americans had tried to end wars and tried being the operative term there, starting with, I started with the French and Indian War and went all the way through at, at that point, the, the present meaning um, Afghanistan, Iraq, the so-called war on terror, and thinking about the ways in which as much emphasis as we put on the origins of war, I don't think as historians, we've spent enough time thinking about how to bring wars to a close. Mm -hmm. And you know, Vietnam certainly plays into that, Korea plays into that. So. I'll, I'll just say that, that I think it's worth really thinking about as a, as a collective, as a nation, that being very thoughtful, that things can't happen very quickly, that the lack of, of planning, I think, explains so much that unfolded in the years following Appomattox. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we're not going to get to the rest of the questions, but a very brief one to end on before I turn it back over to my colleague, Phyllis, is when did President Andrew Johnson, whom we haven't talked about yet tonight, declare the war legally over? He will finally do so in April of 1866 for every state except Texas, and then Texas in August of 1866. Great. Thank you so much, Caroline. Um, it was a pleasure having you with us this evening. Thank and you. Thanks to everyone else who joined us for this special program tonight. We appreciate your time. Phyllis? Thank you, Caroline, for tonight's discussion. Um, as Aaron noted, you know, the questions that came across earlier, when I was reading the book, I also couldn't help but compare the current situation in Russia and Ukraine. So I appreciated um, hearing your thoughts on that. Um, gives everyone a lot to think about. And uh, so that was good. Now, if you haven't already registered for our upcoming webinars, then I would encourage you to visit our website at lincolnpresidential.org and sign up soon. Next up, we will have a daytime program entitled Churchill's Views of the American Civil War on May 5th at 1 p.m. with Lee Pollock. Following that, plan to join us on Wednesday, May 18th for our four score speaker series featuring Dr. Lucas Morrell, which will include a discussion of his book, Lincoln and the American Founding.
As we close out tonight, I want to remind our listeners that recently our foundation began a new role leading and supporting efforts across the nation and perhaps the world to share the story of Abraham Lincoln's life, legacy, and leadership. As part of this new role, the foundation has changed our name and adopted a new brand and began working to achieve a new and broader mission. We hope that you will continue in your support of this new mission as we continue to move forward with our uh, commitment to the unfinished work of our time. If you'd like more information, visit our website at lincolnpresidential.org. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening and for your own ongoing generous support. We are truly grateful. Until next time, good night. <laughs>